Damaged Defenders by Sherza. Chapter 96. Steve Benaheim. Steve breathed a not-so-discreet sigh of relief when they managed to get out of Alfheim in one piece. He spent the entire day torn between thoroughly amused at Tony steamrolling over everyone in sight and worried Tony would get himself killed antagonizing everyone. He had honestly been surprised when Tony's gambit had worked. Well, for a value of worked. According to both Thor and Loki, anything even remotely resembling an equal partnership with the elves just wasn't going to happen by playing nice, thanks to their snobbery regarding magic. It went against Steve's grain to basically bully them into playing nice, but with the situation they were facing and the fact being nice wasn't going to work, well, he might not like it, but he was pragmatic enough to use whatever worked. Trusting Tony to handle the elves had been risky, but Tony had been right. Steve's usual way of handling people just wouldn't have worked. Now, though, it was his turn again, as they were headed to Vanaheim, which was a heck of a lot friendlier in general than the elves, and would be a lot friendlier to them in particular because of Frigate. And boy, what a change it was when they arrived. A guy that reminded Steve strongly of Tyre, who himself looked enough like an older Thor to pass as Thor's brother, was waiting for them dressed in an outfit surprisingly similar to Thargene's that was far more practical than ceremonial, what was basically a t-shirt under a breastplate, jeans, and boots. He was waiting for them just beyond the landing zone, alone, except for the horse off to one side, when the Bifrost receded and promptly hugged the staffing out of Thor and Loki both! <laughs> Steve nearly laughed at the tolerant eye roll the exuberant greeting got from Loki. Thor, on the other hand, hugged right back with every evidence of enthusiasm. Nuff, yes. It has been far too long since last you visited our far realm. The man scolded with a smile. And you bring new friends with you. So this was evidently Pal Thor. Or maybe Frigga's other brother, who hadn't been named. But Steve suspected Pal Thor. He, they'd been told he was a lot like Thor, but good grief! It's good to see you again, Uncle. Thor said, grinning ear to ear. These are Tony Stark, Steve, Rogers, and Soldier, from Earth. Soldier! The guy asked, frowning slightly more in confusion than in displeasure. Then the expression cleared to one of understanding and compassion. Oh! Yes, Frigga mentioned him when she visited a few days past. Something about being captured and twisted into knots by an enemy, and amnesia? Yes, Thor said. Hmm. Well, if anyone can get him put to rights, it's your mother and I. Those two are a little scary on the healing front. Then the guy focused on the three of them. And please forgive me my bad manners, but it's been the best part of a century since I last saw these two. I am King Palthor, but please do me the favor of dispensing with the formality and just call me Palthor. Come, you can meet my wife. We'll get you fed. Then do some talking, yes? The sooner we get how to deal with Thanos figured out, the better. Agreed, sir. Steve couldn't quite call the man just by his name. It went against the grain. Even if you thought someone with rank, military or otherwise, was full of utter crap, and Steve had felt that way a lot in his life, you still well respected their rank. Somehow, even when they told you to cut it out with the titles, his mom would come back from the dead and kick his butt if he didn't at least sir and ma'am, folks. Balthor gave him an amused look, like he knew what Steve was thinking. Steve wouldn't put it past him. Balthor headed for his horse, and they rode to the capital city. Balthor kept up an easygoing conversation the whole way, telling them all sorts of things about Anaheim, and about Thor and Loki, and a few of their youthful foibles, Steve supposed they'd be called. Stunts they'd pulled his little kids on visits to Anaheim, anyway. Steve noticed a theme to the stories, though. They all poked a bit of good-natured fun at Thor, not Loki. Steve had a feeling that was deliberate. Frigga was bound to have told her own brother what Loki had been through in the last year or so. But Thor seemed to genuinely like Loki, so Steve was betting the man had decided to go easy on Loki for a while, which is about the only concession for his trauma that Loki'd been willing to accept thus far. They're met at the palace door by a woman that reminds Steve more than a little of Darcy. Taller than Darcy by a good six inches or so, but with the same sort of generous curves and long dark brown hair with a dusting of gray in it. She greeted Balthor warmly. Very warmly. Warmly enough to make Steve blush. Well, at least they were clearly still very much in love. Beside him, Tony was grinning and snickering at him. 
We have got to work on that blushing thing, Cap. You look like a tomato. He said surprisingly quietly. Steve snorted at him, but didn't say anything. The odds of him not blushing weren't good. At least not right now. He knew better than to say as much to Tony, though, because the man had taken it as a challenge to wear the blush right out of Steve with all sorts of scandalous and or embarrassing things. Worse, he tried to get the rest of the gang to help him, and Steve wasn't going to bet on just how many of them would join Tony in his efforts. If there was one thing he'd learned with the commandos, it was to never ever present yourself as a legitimate target for poking fun or pranks or anything of that sort. When the couple finally came up for air, very warm welcome, Steve thought, and blushed a second time. Palthor wrapped an arm around his wife. This is Vanilla McQueen. And the way he said that, he didn't quite mean my wife, nor the woman who is queen, so much as this is the woman who is queen of my life. Vanilla, these are Donnie Stark, Steve Rogers, and Soldier from Earth. Vanilla smiled at them. It's wonderful to meet you, she said. Steve was fully prepared to swear she looked like she wanted to hug them, but was restraining herself. Thor and Loki were quite so lucky and came in for another pair of hugs. Just like with Paul Thor, Loki tolerated the affection while Thor welcomed it and returned it in full measure. Now, boys, we've got a good meal set out. Figure told us you've visited most of the other rooms by now and been subjected to who knows what in the way of cuisine. So we figured you'd be in the mood for something a bit more familiar, when Nova said. Then once lunch is over, we can talk business. And then she herded the lot of them into the palace and from there to the kitchens with the sort of efficiency Steve had at one point associated with moms, but had since learned it was a rather common trait even in women who didn't have children, Peggy, Pepper, and Marcy being cases in point. Heck, all the women in the tower at it to one degree or another. Lunch proved to be recognizable even to Steve. Sandwiches. Granted, the beads and condiments were different, but still, very familiar. At least Bucky was getting a little better about eating and drinking. He still had to be given permission, but one blanket permission per meal was all he needed to eat and drink a reasonable amount. Steve wasn't sure if he was eating until he was full or not, but he at least wasn't starving himself either. There's also a virulently green fruit juice drink that tastes like a cross between cherries and watermelon with maybe a dash of ginger thrown in. Weird as it gets, but not horrible. It wasn't just them and the king and queen, either. There were roughly a dozen men and women who joined them, all of whom Steve assumed were actually members of the military or Pathos and Vanilla's court. Better, a bunch of kids of varying ages bounced in and out, going to one adult or the other. It made it pretty clear that the Vanier were rather family-oriented. Or at least a whole heck of a lot less formal than any of the other realms, one of the two. Maybe even both. Launch away, Paul Thor sat forward. Now, Asgard may have stopped hanging about Earth for a thousand years or so. But we made it a policy a long time ago to keep an eye on things. So we've had one of our folks who can walk the secret has, like Loki can do, pop in every few decades or so. So we're not quite so ignorant, IRL, as most of the others. Palvor juggled. That doesn't mean we understand all of what was seen and reported, but we at least have an idea of how things have changed and a vague idea of what human guardians are capable of. The last time someone popped in was... Balthor paused, obviously trying to remember the timing. Ah, yes, I remember now. It was the year after your United States managed to visit your moon. That event was still much talked about in your news when our walker checked in. We were about due for another visit when all the... Balthor waved a hand. Excitement hit. We got a little sidetracked and never sent anyone over. Probably for the best now. Althor introduced everyone at the table, and Steve had been right. Mostly military folks, with a few healers thrown in, and much to Steve's surprise, the head cook for the palace. His surprise must have shown on his face, because Balthor smiled. An army marches on its stomach, Balthor said. We have a system very similar to Asgard's to supply our troops, and those with them who are not from either Asgard or Vanaheim, as I do not believe any of the other realms have such a system. But in order to do that, they will need a rough idea of numbers, so they know how much to cook. Even if the Asgard cooks do the same thing, it's going to be a lot of cooking, sir, Steve said. Earth's armies, all told, number about as many people as you have in this realm total. Balthor blinked. Well, that's... He blinked again. Well, we knew there were a lot of Midgardians, but to have that many just in your militaries. That's quite startling. Yeah, I know. 
Steve said. He's still boggled at the 7 million population himself. For the most part, they'll all be fine on the food front, but I guarantee they won't say no to a home-cooked meal rather than our version of travel food. That got a laugh from Tony. You can say that again. We don't have anything like your magical pouches, so we have to thoroughly preserve and tightly seal the food that we travel with, which tends to not do good things for the taste, though we've gotten better on that over time. Pal Ford looked thoroughly amused. Well then, we'll make sure to have such available. Though there is hope this battle will be over swiftly enough to not necessitate eating on the battlefield. Yeah, that would be nice. Thanos shows up and we beat his ass to die for lunch. That would be awesome. Tony agreed. Steve agreed with that idea too, even if he didn't think it'd really happen that way. It'd be nice if it did, but he seriously doubted it. Friggin' did say that more advanced healing would be much welcome. Winilla said. From what she said, your healers have come quite a long ways, but some of our skills are yet beyond them. Steve nodded. And even if we were on a completely equal footing here, there are going to be a lot of wounded, so every pair of hands we can beg to get folks patched up will be needed. He nodded to the healers. We can set some of you up at hospitals, our version of infirmaries, to handle the civilian casualties, since I know the various realm armies are all going to have their own healers on hand to deal with their own wounded. That and some folks to deal with mid-guardians on the battlefield would be very welcome. I'm not sure what differences there are between us and your people, but we can get you in contact with some healers from Earth so you can compare notes. The head healer nodded. That would be appreciated. Steve turned his attention back to Palthor. We're also arranging for everyone to at least get a chance to take a look at Earth. I know you said you've had people visit on and off, so it's probably less of a concern for your people, but I'd still really like for at least everyone at this table to stop by so they can meet the folks they'll be working with. If at all possible, setting up some war games or something so everyone can get used to each other in a combat situation before we tangle with Thanos would be even better. A sensible suggestion, Balthor agreed, and one I have no problem agreeing to. All in all, it was really quite a nice visit. They spent the day ironing out as many details as they could. Vanaheim, like Asgard, would have its army spread out in various places, rather than all on one continent, like the Nita Valir, or all in space, like the dwarves. That required a bit more planning to coordinate, but the general plan was definitely taking shape. All they could do now was hope it worked. Steve was kind of glad they'd saved Vanaheim for the next to last, mostly because it gave Loki a ready excuse to ditch them in favor of an aunt and uncle he hadn't seen in a hundred years. Not that Loki would have ditched them without such a convenient excuse, given where they were going next. This way, the ditching wasn't quite so painfully obvious, allowing Loki to have some shred of, well, whatever it was he needed to keep himself together. Because tomorrow was their last stop on the realm tour. In Jotunheim. That night before bed, Tony corralled Soldier with Thor and Loki's help. Steve, who knew what Tony was going to do, sat in front of Soldier. Okay, Soldier. The place we're going tomorrow is extremely cold. The sort of cold that can freeze you solid in a very short amount of time if you're not careful. Your arm is made of metal, and that is not going to do good things for you in those sorts of temperatures if it's just left as is. We knew really cold temperatures would come up, even if we didn't know you'd be coming with us to Jotunheim, so we installed a heater in the arm to warm the metal to a tolerable temperature and keep it there. Tony said, the heater's behind the upper panel of your arm, and it will only take me about a minute to get it working. Soldier let it happen with the sort of blank face, dead still compliance he'd probably been forced into learning at the hands of his captors. It was enough to make Steve a little crazy, but the heater was necessary. Jotunheim apparently regularly dropped well below all but the sort of temperatures found in the Antarctic in the dead of winter. Even normal winter temperatures would do unfortunate things to a metal arm attached flesh if it wasn't properly dealt with. Steve didn't even want to know what sort of damage Jotunheim's cold could do. And he resolutely refused to think about the sort of damage the cryo had done because that was even colder.